watching Bolt.net, the coolest show for kids on the planet. We're here at Lori Park Zoo this week to learn about some pretty amazing animals. Did you know that there's only approximately 1,800 manatees left in the state of Florida and only four white lions on exhibit in the United States? And some of them are right here. Maybe later, if we're lucky, we'll get to see them. Tell you what, I'm going to go see what other kinds of animals live here at Lori Park. these animals is making me really tired. I'll tell you what, I'm going to take a break and you guys check in with Tips by Tony. Oh my gosh, it's time for Tips by Tony. Hi kids, I'm Tony, a referee at this rink today. What we're going to show you today is slashing. This is the signal for slashing. When a referee goes over to the penalty box and he reports a slashing penalty, He'll take this arm, he'll stick this arm out, and then he'll chop his arm like that and say, slashing. So everybody in the whole arena knows that it is slashing. We're going to go down to our rink. The game is already in progress. And uh, we're going to show you a couple of uh, indications of slashing. Now I see this uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning player here in the white has a high stick in his, in his face. But if this guy takes a stick and does one of those, that is slashing. He'll take his stick and hack at him and possibly get him in the shoulder or the neck or somewhere. And that's a dangerous play. That's why we call it slashing. He'll get a two minute penalty. He'll go to the box. Now these players here, these players, this guy will take his stick and slash him in his midsection. That's when he's going to hurt him right in the belly. And that's when we say that is slashing. So he goes to the penalty box. He'll probably look at me and say, uh, what, I don't know what I'm saying. He'll look at me like I'm a few french fries short of a Happy Meal. So we'll go down to this player and we'll put him into the box and then we'll go over to these players because they're having a problem. These players have got their sticks all together, but this one comes out with his stick and he slashes his other stick and that is also slashing. When you slash another stick, knock it out of his hand or you knock his leg down, that is also slashing. So. We'll skate him over to the penalty box and give him more penalties if he wants them. But if you get hit by a stick, you know when you get hit by a stick because it hurts. And when you see a fight break up because of slashing, take a stick, hit somebody with it, you're going to get mad. So, you know, it happens in hockey. If you don't like the contact in hockey, play baseball. But here we go. This is a uh, slashing penalty that is uh, a kind of a violent thing you want to stay away from and uh, takes away from the game. So we're gonna put these guys back into where they were and have them play a friendly game. Okay, we're gonna go from here in a friendly game. No more slashing, guys, okay? Zoo here at Lori Park. Got a hungry guy right here. Here you go. You can hear his lips hitting the air. We're learning about all kinds of neat animals. Tell you what though, you guys want to learn some hockey? Check out Hockey 101 with Brian Bradley.
Hi, I'm Brian Bradley with the Tampa Bay Lightning. With me today are Sean and John of the Suncoast Stars, and today's lightning tip is forward skating. Okay, here we are with uh, today's lightning tip is forward skating. And what we're going to do is just talk about the starting position in forward skating. What you want to do for all you young hockey players out there is you want your feet about shoulder width apart, your knees and ankles bent a bit, so you got good, good stance, good stability, your, uh, your shoulders square to the target so when you skate and you're slightly leaning forward. Here I have John. And what we're going to do, just go over the posture with John, is uh, what we want is uh, he's, he's, he's facing forward. You've got your knees bent, your knees and ankles bent a bit. Not too much, you don't want to bend too far down. And then what you want is your uh, feet shoulder width apart. They could be a little bit wider, a little bit wider. You know, and leaning forward a bit and make sure your head's up. You never want to have your head down looking at the ice. You always want your head up. That's perfect position now, so he's ready to start off in a forward position. Well, here we are in the skating position. You're pushing off on your inside edges, as you can see. Your gliding leg is bent. Your weight is shifting from side to side. And your recovery leg is coming back into the middle at all times. Well, here come Sean and John with the Suncoast Stars. Their heads are up. Their feet look shoulder width apart. Good knee bent. Good strides back and forth. Well, that wraps up another edition here today. I'm Brian Bradley with the Tampa Bay Lightning. I'd like to thank my assistants, Sean here and John, with the Suncoast Stars. I'd like to uh, thank everybody for watching. We'll see you next time on Lightning Hockey Tips. You ever been spit on by a llama? Well, I hope I never am, so I'm going to walk away from here right now. Hopefully, later on, I'm going to be able to find those manatees and the white lions. And while I'm on my trek, you guys check this out. I'm David. Kids, I found somebody to talk to us about the white lions. Hi, Glenn. Hi, nice to meet you. you. Yeah. Well, well. So when did these guys get here? They got here uh, on November 9th of 1996 and will be on exhibit until March 30th of 1997. And so what exactly is a white lion? Why are they white? Okay. Um, what happens is, is that in white lions, um, they are not albinos. They are leucistic. And what it is is that normally they have a recessive gene that makes them actually the tawny color like the, the males that you see in our exhibit. But Noconda, who is our female, has the dominant white gene that makes her leucistic. So oh, that's why she's white. So even though he's not exactly white, he's still considered a white lion? Well, yes, because he carries the gene, yet I it's see, recessive. I see. And so how old are they? Um, let's see, they'll be about 10 months old, and we're going to celebrate their birthday in March. They were born on St. Patrick's Day. And therefore, their African names, Nokanda, Tombo, and Tony, have St. Patrick's connotations. Nokanda means lucky, Tombo means charm, and Tony means clover. Oh, they're really cute. So, how how much do they weigh now? I mean, they're not they're well, big, and they're babies. <laughs> they are they are considered cubs. Um, right now, they're weighing probably around 80 pounds, 80 to 90 pounds, and through adulthood, they can get up to be about 300 pounds. So they're rather large cats. And, oh, look at him. He's like, <laughs> what's going on? Who's over there? How many white lions are there on the exhibit in the United States? On exhibit, there's about three white lions here in the United States, and there's about 30 known to exist in the world. So mm -hmm. it's very rare that one would be on exhibit here in the Tampa Bay area. So it's, it's important to come see it because um, it's a once, it really is a once-in-a-lifetime deal. Right. Well, when you say three, does that, do you mean three like of the females that have the recessive trait, including the brothers? Or? Um, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure exactly. Okay. I just know the number. Is, it could be like three or four, mm -hmm. but I don't know exactly what, if there's a male on exhibit or a female on exhibit. Mm -hmm. So in the wild, would you see a white lion in the wild? Um, it's a possibility, but the reason that um, we try to conserve the white lion is because they are white. And what will happen is, is they won't blend into the natural background of the, of the Timbavadi in Africa. And so they are um, open for prey, being, one being maybe the hyena. Right. 
Right. Um, and so they really typically don't exist too much in the wild for that reason because they can, they're open to prey. What kind of things do lions eat in the in the? They eat in um, captivity. In captivity, they'll eat a, a a feline mixture like somewhat like a kitty chow, plus some some meats that are mixed in with it. Mm -hmm. um, and our commissarian, who's worked here for many many years, um, is the one who prepares the meals for the lions. Um, I don't know exactly how much, but I know it is some sort of like a kitty chow mixed with the meat mixture and stuff that'll give them a lot of vitamins and keep them very healthy while they're while they're here at the zoo. Mm -hmm. And how long will the, these white lions be on exhibit here at Lori Park? Um, to, until March 30th, and then they're going to go to Metro Toronto Zoo. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Oh, well, thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. at the manatee pools and we're going to talk to Lynn. Lynn is actually a manatee keeper or zoo keeper and she's going to tell us all about them. Hi Lynn. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Very good. So who, who have we got down here? This is New Bob and uh, New Bob's been with us since New Year's Day in 1993 and he came to us as an orphan calf without a mom and couldn't survive on his own in the wild. Oh look here he comes. Oh can you guys see this? Can I touch him? Give him a biscuit. Give him a biscuit. Him a biscuit. Yep. Okay. He loves his New biscuit. Bob. Look, there he is. He's kind of got like little whiskers. Yeah, that's why Brissy in there, and uh -huh. you can uh, you can really feel it. It helps them grasp their food in the wild because they're pulling up aquatic weeds. <laughs> he was found on New Year's Day, and a man named Bob called in to say he saw an orphan calf, calf that he didn't think was old enough to be on its own, so that's how he kind of got his name, New Bob. <laughs> was he injured at the time when you no, guys him? No, this is an abscess scar that he's had a problem with an abscess in his shoulder, and we've had to do surgical work on him, and uh, that's the scar from uh, draining the abscess. And he's been here how long? Since New Year's Day, 93. Okay. And how much did he weigh when he was brought in? He was 129 pounds when he came in, and he's close to 1,000 now. Wow. So what's the maximum weight they get? Oh, well, a male can get to be 3,000 pounds in their adult life, but he, it'll take them a long time to get that big. But an average, an average male could be 15 to 1,800 pounds. Uh-huh. And are the, are the males bigger than the females? Yeah, usually by a couple of hundred pounds. They eat all this lettuce, too? Yeah. This will uh, be gone by tomorrow morning. This pool will be spotless. How much do you feed them a day? Well, with all the manatees that we have here, we are feeding about 20 cases of romaine a day. Wow. Keeping the lettuce, lettuce company yeah. in business. We are. California <laughs> likes us. How many manatees do you have here at the center? Right now we have four residents and we have five patients in the hospital. And they range from boat wounds to cold stress to crab trap lines on their pecs and orphan calves. So basically in the wild when some does somebody spot an injured calf or I mean how does that work how do you yeah, work the, the public is well aware now of manatees and their plight and there's an 800 number you can call and a lot of the public knows it it's 1-800 dial FMP and that's the Florida Marine Patrol and they will um, come they will call DEP who oversees the manatees and they will go out and check out the situation and then they get in touch with us and there's a chain of command and they usually end up bringing us um, an injured manatee Manatees are obviously very friendly, right? Yes, they're very friendly. They've often been called the gentle giant. Aww. They're very gentle creatures. They have no, no, uh, no bad intentions with man. It, actually, it's their friendliness that sometimes gets them into trouble because they will approach boats and boaters. And what kind of advice would you give somebody if they just are swimming or boating and they, and they come across one? Well, it's, it's would be really great to just watch them stop and slow down and take a look and, and watch what the manatee does. But as far as trying to feed it anything, you probably shouldn't do that. And uh, we don't want to try and encourage manatees to come up to boats because at some point that that might get them in trouble, that behavior, because at some point the, another moat might hit them. Right. So. So even though it looks like, I mean, at the moment, it might be really neat to, yes. to pet them and play yes. with them because they're so friendly. In but the long run, that could cause them harm, and, and they could end up in a hospital being hit by a boat at right. some point. So it's probably not a good idea, although it's very tempting, very tempting. 
So new Bob seems to be a little bit more um, comfortable around us. He's hanging yeah. around over here. And this one over here, what's what's that one's name? That one's name is Lucky Frank. And he came to us last year and he had a severe cold stress and he was frostbitten. And the white scarring that you see on his body is the leftover scar tissue from where he was frostbit. Most of it did heal up. And uh, we did have six manatees last year that came in with cold stress and frostbite, and he's the only one that survived out of the six, so that's why we call him Lucky Frank now. Lucky Frank. Yeah. Well, why did they get um, frostbite? How did the they get Last year we had a, a relatively cold winter, and he was pulled out of water that was uh, measuring 55 degrees. So the, the calves kind of, when they're, and we find last year that it was with the young ones, they seem to get into trouble more when we have the colder weather. The older ones handle the cold better, it seems. And all the calves that we got in last year that had cold stress were about two years old. So manatees are mammals. Yes. And um, are they indigenous to Florida only, or do manatees well, live anywhere else in yeah, the world? Yeah, they do, but there's different species of manatee. There's an Amazonian manatee that only lives in the Amazon River. And the one we have here is a West Indian manatee. There's a West African manatee. And there's a dugon, which is um, native to the Australia area, and it's only found there. Mm -hmm. So it's just the West Indies manatee yes, that's, that's what endangered? We have. Yeah, or? well, that we have. There's different problems in different areas of the world. The dugon, there really isn't a problem, but the Amazonian manatee is in great danger. But they have different problems. They don't have boaters hitting manatees down there. They have native people that are using the population as a food source, and it's disappearing. Uh. So, And that's, that's a natural thing for them down there, but it's just getting to the point where there's not enough manatees anymore for that to continue. So uh, worldwide, there's different problems in different parts of the globe. In the wild, how do people track manatees? Is it, I mean, I notice they all have their own little nicks and scars. Yes, they is, do. is that The state does keep a catalog of scar patterns, and they can identify them th from the air. But we're also using two different methods now. There's a freeze brand, and if you look really close at New Bob, which I don't know if it'll show up on camera, He's been freeze branded with number 52, and you can see it's on his shoulders and right at the base of his tail. Oh. And you can see that for a while from the sky, and the, the state takes counts from planes up in the sky. But they're also using a new system. When we get a manatee in, we now scan them with scanners, and they have some of the manatees will have pit tags in them, passive integrated transponders and they're injected you can get this in your pets now at your local I was veterinarian say we learned about that at the yeah. Humane society well yeah. the man we've been doing that with manatees for a couple of years here so whenever we get one in we always scan it we have a scanner here at the in the hospital and we scan it to see if it's been identified or tagged about how many manatees or west indies manatees are there left in the world well that's you know that's a really varied question there's a, a couple of different numbers last year they were saying possibly as high as 2000 maybe 1,800 to 2,000, or it could be lower than that. We're just not really sure. It's hard to do a count on them. You don't know sometimes if you're counting the same animals twice. What would be the manatee's worst enemy? That would probably have to be man and, and our activities, mm -hmm. as wanting to live in the same habitat close to the water as the manatee. It causes a problem for the manatee, and also the boating incidents has caused big problems for the manatee. Mm -hmm. How can we prevent that? Um, I don't know that there's a lot that we can do to prevent it in Florida because it's it's one of the most attractive places to live here on the coastline and boating is certainly a, a very popular sport. Uh, I think just through education and awareness maybe we can change some of the things but I don't think we'll be able to prevent it. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to relocate the manatees somewhere where no. similar lifestyle? Well, a lot of the manatees use the same routes. Um, season after season they feed in the same places and they go to the same places so it's it's kind of their it's their habitat and we're intruding into it. Well, Lynn, thank you so much You're for welcome. the visit and the information. That was that was very nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, that concludes our tour of Lori Park Zoo today. If you guys want to learn more about the manatee or the white lion, you can do that by going to yahoo.com. Yahoo is the search engine. You type in www.yahoo.com and then once you get there, type in Lori Park Zoo. And that'll take you right to the website. And Lori Park lists all their animals from A to Z. And you can learn about anything here at the park. From me and everybody here at Bolt.net, take care.